in honor of Kyle, we'll start the show with some scary music. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. You're entering the podcast engineering show where you might be killed, maimed, or hacked up with a hatchet. <laughs> This it, music is really scary, right, Kyle? That that's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yes, that is ridiculous, and you must have butt dialed this show. Welcome. Uh huh. Yes. Welcome back to the podcast engineering show. I can't believe we're here again, having fun. It's it's great when you could just, you know, live and have fun. I mean, uh, we all have responsibilities, but this show is a time to have fun and learn. Welcome to the Podcast Engineering Show. My name is Chris Curran. I produce podcasts for the likes of E+, Dun & Bradstreet, and Forbes, and select business authors. Every week on this show, we bring you podcast production techniques on a silver platter. We talk shop all about the audio engineering aspects of podcast production. I have guest experts, podcast producers, and engineers. I have a background in audio engineering in the music business. And when I entered podcasting about five years ago, I noticed a huge lack of audio skills in podcasting in general. Not only podcasters, but editors, producers, ev- a lot of people in podcasting, most everyone, doesn't have the fundamental audio engineering background. And so that's what this show is all about. And if you implement the best of what you learn here, because you might learn some stuff that you might not want to (laughs) implement, but if you learn some stuff that's worthwhile to implement, your podcasts will sound a lot better and you'll spend a lot less time producing them. Of course, Barry is here with me. Barry, this is going to be a good one, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Um, Hey, Kyle, did you meet Barry yet? This is Barry, the maintenance guy from my old building. Hey, Barry, nice to meet you. Oh, forget it. <laughs> Barry, what is Kyle going to need to have a really good appearance on the podcast engineering show? Like Just, just to knock it out of the park in, in this session of the podcast engineering show, what is Kyle going to need, our, our guest? You're going to need a couple of horses or a couple of mules. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, look, let's get to it. Kyle P. Snyder is here. I'm going to call him Kyle, but he's Kyle P. Snyder, just like I'm Christopher F. Curran, and there's Ralph M. Rivera, who, you know. That's a rough middle initial there, man, but I'm just just saying. (laughs) Oh, oh, man. I sh- should I just say the whole name then instead of the just I, F- I didn't I didn't even I don't even know what it is. I'm just saying like you're, you're really teeing me up. What do you want me to do with that? I teach college. <laughs> well, I'm so psyched. Kyle P. Snyder, lecturer at Ohio University School of Media Arts and Studies. He's also a freelance engineer and consultant for White Coat Audio, and he's the chair of education at AES. That's the Audio Engineering Society. And I'd like to uh, think that means something, but it just means no one else wants to do it. So, <laughs> well, you're also going to be uh, you're also up. You're going to be the, one of the chairs. I mean, you're going to be one of the um, what was it? Governors. Yeah, governor. I, I, I'm I'm governor elect again. No one else wanted to do it. So, <laughs> you know, they threw some candy out. I was the first guy to pick it up off the ground. You know? <laughs> it, led every- me, it led me to a van. What do you want? So. <laughs> and everybody laughed at you, and you're like, "What?" Yeah, they're like, "Oh, that poor guy. Oh, it's that's a shame." Yeah, no. No, it's it's actually it's it's an honor, but yeah, still. So we were put in touch by Mary, the Mary Mazurik, <laughs> who is just an incredible person and just been uh, introducing me to lots of cool folks to be guests on this show. So thank you, Mary. And um, you you in the past have also designed studios. You've done classical engineering. You do post production for films. I mean, you've done a lot in audio, Kyle. It's that's what people tell me. Yeah, it's 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 been a fun life. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I've had sort of a weird, circuitous route into audio. I went to a school of music and I got really into classical engineering. And I, I initially thought that I wanted to do live sound, but nobody wants that life. That's terrible. Because uh, <laughs> carrying, carrying stuff, I'm like, you know, a mic stand is super heavy. I don't want to carry like backline <laughs> shit. That's terrible. Uh, <laughs> it sounds horrible. Yeah. Um, 
I'm I'm a I'm a thin lanky guy. I'm not I'm not doing that. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I I got super into the science of it, and I fell in love with classical music because like you know that's that's how you impress all the girls, right? <laughs> um, right. Yes. Um, exactly. That's <laughs> the same with podcasting too. That's how we get all the women. Oh, um, is that not true? It, it is very true. I need to. I really need to. I think work on my game. Then I'll. We'll, we'll talk later. Anyways, all right. So what? One of the things we're going to talk about in this session is you teach an audio book class where you actually teach the students how to basically paint a sonic portrait, and 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 that's not um, that's not very easy, right? I mean, we we were talking before, and you were saying how like with video sometimes it's easy with images to just throw stuff together, but with audio it's a lot more difficult, right? Yeah. So. Whenever I first landed here, I, I came here actually whenever uh, the university was going from uh, the quarter system to the semester system, and we were looking for an, a lot of like cool, interesting, like sort of extra, what I call sort of the X, the X factor classes, right? Like what's going to make you new and different and like super valuable in the real world. And one of the things that we kicked around was like, what, what if we could do something with our NPR uh, affiliate, uh, which happens to be WOUB Public Media here at Ohio University? And there, uh, back in the day, there happened to be something uh, that we called Wired for Books. And it was literally just recording. It was taking a long-form audiobook and literally just sitting down and, okay, reading page after page after page. Uh, and there, w- there wasn't a lot of artistry in that. Uh, but we decided, what if we re- reinvented that, right? Like, what if we got the kids in the studio and if we... Uh, you know, we let them pick the audiobook. We let them, you know, pick all the sounds. We let them come up with the music. And we let them sort of decide what direction do we want them to take this in. And for my money, teaching audio without video, but in sort of a narrative storytelling form, that's always been sort of the best way to start students out on their career path because they're sitting there and they realize, oh my gosh, I have to evoke these really wild emotions, right? Like I have to convey spatiality and, you know, distance and and all this great stuff, but I don't have visuals as a crutch, right? And for those of you who do do, do uh, post-production with, with video, um, you might not realize it, but, um, you know, whenever you're sitting there and, you know, I whenever I'm cutting a film, I'll be thinking, oh, okay, well, this is what I'm seeing on screen, so that's what I have to convey, right? Mm. You don't have that whenever you have, have an audio book. You know, you actually have to, you know, come up with the notion of what would you be hearing right now? Like, you have to be completely creative. It's it's very compositional, and that's a little bit of my background. I, I of all things, I hate to admit it, but um, part of my undergraduate degree was electronic music, and so that helps me be fairly creative at times. And so students come in and they realize, okay, so we have to create something out of nothing, which is really amazing. So they have to sort of paint what I call a sonic portrait, right? And then as they go through this, they realize how big a part of sound for picture the sound really is, right? There's all these um, running, not even jokes, but there's all these running anecdotes of in uh, sound for film, how big a part of the film is sound. And, you know, some people will say 50-50. Uh, I'm, I'm really snotty, and I like to say 70%. Um, and But, like... Obviously, that's because of who I am, because, you know, I'm obviously a really super nice guy. But <laughs> yeah. I, I like to think... Th- Stop. No. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that in reality, that that's just straight up pragmatism, because, you know, if you go to a movie and if you close your eyes, if you can't pick up at least 70 to 80 percent of the cues of what's going on, they did a really bad job mixing that film, because you have right away... You've got, first of all, all the dialogue, because you can't really see dialogue. That's just, you know, unless you're a really great lip reader, and those people are good. I'm not, I don't have that skill. But, you know, then you've got all the left to right action. You know, you've got the spatiality. Maybe someone walked into a room, and so, like, you got that sort of Frank Lloyd Wright moment, right, where, you know, you walked into a room, and the room expanded or contracted, so you have that great, you know, change in reverb or space. Mm. Um, you know, you've got the, you know, the ambiance. You know, are you outside, inside? You know, are there some sort of, like, off-screen diegetic things happening, right? Like, you have all these great cues. You don't have any of that if you just plug your ears and you're watching it and, okay, the Hulk's on screen. That's great. What's happening? You got nothing. 
Like it's there's just so much that you lose when the audio is gone. So it, right. it's I mean, obviously, the, the different parts of the craft are like they're very equal. We all do amazing things. And I have such great respect for, you know, m- my brothers and sisters who do all the visual effects that I'm not remotely talented enough to do. <laughs> right. I, I'm serious. Like I, I joke, but it's important to recognize what they do. But this is why I like teaching students. OK forget that video is even there for a minute and learn these skills without the crutch. Because then whenever you step into that that point in time when you have the vid- the visuals, then you can be like, I know how to do this. Right. Then you're not trying to then you're not trying to create it to match it. You're trying to create that thing that you already know how to do it. Because you already did that and you were awesome at it. Like right. it's it's just so much more freeing. Um, and I think there's a lot of times in audio, not even in and podcasting or that but just even straight up music recording where you're like yeah like i'm just i'm trying to make this sound that i've heard before well to heck with that no go make that sound that you want to hear and then like it will come to you organically right. um, and I, th- I think that sometimes we just sort of lack creativity um, but that's a generational issue that we'll just skip for now <laughs> <laughs> well look you bring up such a great and point. vamp yes exactly <laughs> cue the music and if uh it's like if if, if a student can learn how to work the audio with no help from the visuals, then you're right. When yeah. they step into any other role with visuals, it's going to be like the easiest job. And and that's where a lot of video people get, well, frustrated for sure is with, with the yeah. audio because they're not sure how to do it. So I definitely want to ask you how you actually do this with audio. How do you create <laughs> that emotion? How do you create the space and all that? Well, we can get into that a little bit. But first, we forgot to do our speed round. Um, oh, Barry, should we just forget course. the speed round for this session? No way. You crazy? Okay. I didn't think so, but I mean, I'm just saying. All right. So because he's, he's a stickler. I like him. He's a good guy. He, he's keeping you honest, and I appreciate that. Someone has to. <laughs> See, you're because you're a guy that can handle this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this to you right now. So, uh, Barry, um, <laughs> Kyle is the host of the AES Journal podcast. Have you, have you listened to uh, that podcast? Oh, you did. Okay. And, and what were your, uh, what did you hear when you listened to that podcast? There's no activity, no giggle, no nothing. (laughs) He's not wrong, man. Dude. He's not wrong. Barry. No, but the AES Journal podcast, you've been doing it for a long time. You're the host and producer. Um, So why don't we do the speed round? Take us through when when you're about to literally record uh, the AES Journal podcast. Tell me your setup, the mic and what he got it plugged into. How are you recording it? Just your equipment and workflow. Just briefly over. Give us the overview. Yeah, absolutely. And I realize so, and I realize today you have a different setup, but <laughs> tell us about your normal no, setup. <laughs> well, so it's it's worth pointing out that um, a good engineer should be able to deal with a variety of circumstances and when life gives you things that are falling apart, uh, make some variant of electronic lemonade with that. <laughs> so today I walked in and the studio was because I work in a in a, in a large facility we're in the midst of a few rounds of maintenance, and there were some things that I was not expecting. So uh, today, although one of the facilities that I would tend to use uh, adjacent to me uh, houses a really, truly fabulous Rupert Neve 5088 with uh, a full penthouse of porticos uh, and <laughs> a, a full complement of microphones. And wow. um, d- yeah, I mean, we've got you know a bunch of 1176s that I tend to use mm. uh, for a lot of things like that. And there's some Grace Prees and uh, a bunch of things like that. I I will say that for the podcast, I tend to switch it up between this room and the other room. So in this room, I'll run my TLM 103 that I'm using right now through through the Neve preamp because there's something very nice about the 103 distorting against that analog preamp and then coming through the uh, the 541 modules. Uh, and then I, I, I record into Nuendo uh, because that's the type of guy that I am. Uh, and then we just use that. We use that as tape. And then I just uh, run an export. Um, today, because things are a little bit uh, funny in here, I have my TLM 103 dumping direct into a USB Pre 2 and uh, hardlining direct to my laptop. Um, but that's what I had in my office, um, and it's working reasonably well. On days when I'm not in this facility, uh, and I'm in our uh, more post production centered facility, uh, that's when I'm using a, a Yamaha Nuage uh, and Steinberg's nu- Nuendo again. Uh, also using a TLM 103 uh, or my personal U87, and um, again uh, Grace preamps, uh, or we all, we've also got some rem- uh, some remoted uh, Yamaha stuff, 
uh, and that all works really fantastically. Um, and um, any anytime I'm doing all that, um, my vocal chain tends to to involve just some light compression with an 1176 and an API uh, bus compressor. Wow. Okay. So when you record your podcast, you record <laughs> your parts, and then you do you actually do the mixing, or do you send it to someone? So I do. I do all the mixing. So the the AES podcast is a fairly um, it's a very uh, simplistic podcast. So I actually receive a script uh, from our uh, technical editor Francis Rumsey, uh, and uh, actually, of all things, the most difficult thing for me is learning how to pronounce uh, the uh, myriad of foreign names. Uh, thank God for Google Translate. Um, hey, I, I have a, a Barry clip for you. I, you should. You can maybe you can borrow this uh, Barry. Um, I'll, I'll see if it goes over well. Yeah, let's see what it is. That's a tongue twister right there. <laughs> I don't. I don't know that one's gonna work. But I'll, I'll try that one. Yeah. Um, but no, so we've got uh, pre-built uh, music beds that we use for the top and the tail, um, and so I record all of my part, and I really can't recall a time when there's been guests, because it's this is actually more of a, an informational podcast, so uh, what we're actually doing is, so there's the AES Journal, uh, which is, uh, it's the uh, 10 months a year uh, proceedings of uh, all the papers and the news uh, from the society. And this is actually sort of a quick play-by-play of this is what came out this month. Uh, and so, you know, you can download that from your favorite uh, podcast uh, source and you can sort of learn about what is out there and if you want to read the journal this month. Hilariously, I've learned a lot just by recording the podcast. I feel a lot a lot smarter. <laughs> <laughs> totally. That's what happens when you teach or talk about It's true. Things. No, yeah. of all things, the best way to learn is just to teach. Yeah. Totally. I really only have a high school diploma. Yeah, that, that, yeah. There, there's no education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right, so you mix it down. So you mix it in Nuendo. I do, yeah. Okay. Um, which, I mean, I, for my money, I mean, I, I think is honest to God the best mixing experience that, that is out there. But I know that there are a zillion different options and, right. you know, everyone can, use, everyone can use whatever they want. Nuendo is also hellaciously overmatched for, for doing a podcast. I use that for film sound and, and classical work, and so oh. I'm just not going to jump. I'm not going to jump out to another DAW just for the podcast, because um, you know if I want to do uh, my clip gain or you know anything else like that, um, it's just easier to do that in Nuendo, uh, which I'm comfortable with. Right, and Nuendo. Um, I remember when they when Nuendo came out, it was like it morphed out of something else, like around 2000 or something, didn't it? So I, um, I'm, I don't I, I don't want to completely botch the history, but you know if for anyone out there who's used uh, Cubase. Um, uh, yes. It's going to look it's going to look uh, rather identical. New Window is essentially the audio post production version of uh, of Cubase. There are a lot of things uh, in New Window that you would recognize. Uh, the big additions are going to be things like uh, there's a reconform engine, there's an ADR engine. Uh, you know they've got uh, their what they call their game audio connect engine, so you can uh, work with WIs. Uh, there's a lot of really cool stuff in there as I accidentally sell their product. Um, but you know, <laughs> as a as a as a uh, as a classical engineer, I like things in there like their take engine. So I'm a big Mac guy, right? But the things that I like in there are there's more than one way to do everything. So there's two different versions of their take engine, which I think is so totally rad mm. because if I don't like the way that it works, I can change it and I can totally modify their entire. Uh, visual interface, which is, I think, very PC uh, oriented, because mm. that's you know where where it oriented from. I also super super. Wait, hold like, on a second. Take uh, engine. Tell tell everybody what a take and what that means. Oh sure. So I mean, if you're going through and you're doing multiple takes or multiple versions of something, you know, you can roll through and um, you know you can have take one. So you know you've you've got uh, the first movement of something. You know, you hit the end, then you go back to the top, and then you do it again. Uh, so this allows you to do you know comping. Or composite editing uh, very easily. Uh, so if you've uh, done anything in like Logic or things like that, um, you'll notice that uh, it looks a lot like Logic's. I won't tell you who stole it from who, uh, but <laughs> why not? Apple didn't. In- Apple didn't invent it. Okay. <laughs> how, how about the, yeah. Uh, All right. <laughs> um, as I uh, the story that I've heard is that because um, Apple bought Logic from eMagic, right? Mm. And uh, eMagic's facility is I'm t- I'm told like. Less than a mile down the road uh, from Steinberg's facility in Hamburg, hmm. so mm. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> but um, no, the thing that I really love about Nuendo is uh, they have like an infinite breakpoint um, fade editor. So like for really delicate stuff like classical, 
you know, you can really get in there. It reminds me a lot of like some of the my favorite uh, classical program is Pyramix, um, which no one has ever heard of. And that's because um, it's a very specialized program and that's OK. Um, you know, it uses um, a paradigm called source destination editing. So essentially you have your source bucket and then you edit to your destination bucket. Mm. And that's just it's not that efficient for traditional music editing, um, although I, I think it's fine. But um, you can sort of pull that off in Nuendo, which I like. Uh, it also, I think, has some of the best uh, parts of Sequoia, which is also a super amazing DAW. But I, I tend to work on them. Yeah. Oh, I never heard yeah. of Sequoia. Um, I, oh, yeah. I, I love Sequoia as well. Uh, that, that one's uh, owned by Magix. Magix. For me, Nuendo is, this is sort the, of... Is this the same Magic? There, there's some company, Magic something, that just bought that's Soundforge. The same one. Yeah. Sony. All, all of Sony. Really. Oh. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Well, like all of Sony audio, I guess it would be the division. So, oh, okay, yeah. And wait, uh, when you mentioned um, and when you mentioned the infinite fade thing in Nuendo, what is, what yeah. does that mean? Like just to delicately so, fade things like into infinity? Yeah. So, like if you if you if you're in Pro Tools, like there's a limit as to how many what I call breakpoints you can have in a fade, right? So, like if you've got just if you've got an equal, I, I'm gesturing as though there are students in front of me, so I must look like like just a, a, a bloody lunatic to anyone. But so if, if you've got an equal power crossfade, so put your arms in front of you and make an X. Uh, right. If, if, you want, if you want to change the way that works, right, you start putting breaks in just like you would with any automation, right? So start drawing that in. So if you want to taper the bottom a little bit, you would put in little breaks. Right. Um, lots of programs have limits on how many breaks you can put in that. Uh, and I've not found a limit in Nuendo yet. Um, I'm sure there must mathematically be, but um, right. it's really cool. So like, if you want to draw in all of those different breakpoints, once you get into their advanced fade editor, you can. So like, if you want to make it super, make like a super hard attack downward, but then taper out the tail, um, like you can always do that in different programs, right. but it would be like, like straight line down and then straight line out, right? But right. this allows you to like make it super delicate and super musical. And that's really important, you know? Like, And honestly, that's super important in all music because why shouldn't you have precision when you're doing stuff? It doesn't matter what the music is. You, you should have super precision in rap and hip hop too. Right. Like, it, it absolutely does. It doesn't, it absolutely doesn't matter what the, what the genre is. Right. Although so. definitely for classical, it yeah, but I'm, that's, that that's the so thing. delicate. Yeah. Honestly, I'm, I don't know this because it's been a long time since I've used it, but I'm pretty sure that Reaper has a functionality pretty pretty similar to this. And so that's what th – this will be my weirdest pitch. Um, my backup DAW and most people that I know who do work like what I do, if we need a backup DAW just for like secondary recording, most of us fall back to Reaper because it's in it's inexpensive and it works phenomenally well. Yeah. Um, actually, I use Reaper. That's all I use. Yeah. I like, mean, why not? So like if I – yeah, if I, if I need something else – um, you can actually, um, and we've we've gone really round the bend, but yeah, if you can do things like source destination editing in Reaper. Uh, not perfect, but it's pretty darn good. Um, and yeah, like I know a lot of people who, like for their secondary DAW, um, will will use that for everything. Um, it's it's really pretty great. So kudos to them. Um, yeah, I don't know. There, there's, there's, there is one company I've not mentioned, and I think there's a there's purple involved in their logo. Purple. But, uh yeah. Yeah, I don't know who it is. Really? And it's n and it's not Apogee. Apogee. That's what I was looking for in the last session of this show. I was <laughs> when we were talking about A to D converters. Apogee. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Nice. Yeah. So which company? Purple logo? I don't, I'm clueless. <laughs> no, I I don't want to denigrate another company cuz oh. they're, they're they, they they, they they have fine employees that do great work, but I I have philosophical issues with where they have gone as a company. So oh, I see. Uh, well, I don't know yes. who it is, but it's okay. I understand what you're saying. You don't want to hurt anybody. It's, We're it's, not here. It's not Microsoft. Yeah, because of all things, I as a hardcore Mac guy, I'm buying a Microsoft Surface this week. So I think now I'm just going to go run my car off the road. Right. So see, I feel the yeah. same way about the Blue Yeti because the Blue Yeti is like the most bashed podcasting mic because it's. Yeah. Always used in the wrong. It's it's just used in the wrong way, in the wrong. It's the wrong tool for the for the job in in most cases. Well, you're, but you're but, you're not supposed to talk into the connectors. <laughs> I think that's the thing. <laughs> no, but like I don't want to bash blue because the blue yeti is a is a fine microphone if you use yeah. it properly. So 
Uh, yeah, and, and who wants to bash anybody? I mean, everybody's out there trying no, to do something good and whatever. It's okay. <laughs> that's, that's I mean, yeah, like behind closed doors, I'll say a lot of unkind things about a lot, a lot of, you know, <laughs> things that bother me. But like, um, that's it's what I'm drinking. I mean, <laughs> oh, um, oh, dude. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's what, I'm drinking, it's what I'm drinking milk and cookies, kids. I know that young yes. s- students might listen. No, it's fine. So, um, so why do yeah. you spend, because I know this, I know one fact about you, actually. Why, wh- how, or should I say, what do you do during the five to six hours you spend producing an eight minute episode of your show? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's a that's a fair question. <laughs> um, you told me five six hours. Honestly, I, I've probably overestimated that over the t- over time. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, but it is pr- absolutely the longest amount of time I've ever spent producing something, except for like whenever I've worked on a film and like I've just received garbage audio and I have to do like nine passes of RX. But you know. For good audio, because I'm capturing good audio myself of myself, mm. uh, it is absolutely an obscene amount of time. Um, I'll tell you the reason that I do it is because I'm producing audio for audio engineers, and I just become insanely self conscious, and I just mm. I don't want it to sound bad. Totally. So I do I do all of the recording and and the mixing and uh, and and the editing, uh, and. Uh, we do have a producer. His name is Jim Anderson. Uh, he is uh, a phenomenal engineer in his own is in, in his own right. And so, um, I, I think honestly, I'm always more self conscious to send it to him um, <laughs> I because th- there was there there were there were there were a few times when I was thinking, you know, this will be fine. Like I'll do the recording. I'll have a, a student edit it, uh, and that will save me a lot of time. And the two times that I did that, he sent it back with notes like. You just just about like the compression or gating, and I'm like, I'm never doing this ever again, <laughs> ever, ever, ever again. And I'm like, it sounded good enough to me. Jim didn't like it. I really don't care. <laughs> it's no, never again, never again with the children. Like, so yeah, I just honestly, it's I think um, my the effort is more to make sure that Jim's happy. So I um <laughs> cool. I I honestly I'll do two to three dry runs with myself like in my office like getting the names right you know making sure that I've sort of got the pronunciation down um, because we've got really cool ones like Agnieszka Rajenska. Um, <laughs> Whoa, that, that's a that's tongue one that twister can, right there. <laughs> that is, yeah. Sorry, Holy Agnieszka. Cow. Um, on, she's a board member who I know, and so I know that that's that's one that comes up really easily. Um, nice. But like like we'll have 15 to 30 names like that in like eight minutes of audio right. so like i do spend a, a, like a lot of time making sure that that there aren't any issues if it, any of them like that are like eastern european i can i, I can pretty easily handle those because like i travel a lot to there and i'm also polish so like i i, I kind of can handle most of those um once it gets into sort of Asia and beyond, then I have to like <laughs> legitimately like like either use Google Translate or like reach out to a friend and be like, uh, need a little bit of help here, right? Um, so I like that it. that I mean that that'll take me an hour or so just to like figure all that out. Right. Um, like obviously then I'll set stuff up. I've got actually a, a template because I'm a lazy sob, <laughs> and no oh, man, smart, you're smart. Look, you got to <laughs> save the time somewhere, um, and. You know, then I'll go through and record. Um, then I'll I'll go through. I'll do a mix pass, and I'll just sort of tighten everything up, like with the music bed and the music bumpers, because obviously I say I'm a lot. If you have not realized, tell me about the mixing phase itself, like about effects and, and fading, and do do you process sure. the audio a lot in the mixing stage? So there's a limit as to how much I really process it. Actually, uh, I I there's the us again. There we there we go, Kyle. <laughs> so I I tend to. Do do fairly heavy processing on the on the vocals, but outside of that, there's not a lot else that I get done because it, this is a fairly serious podcast, or at, le- at least this one. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if if the vocals uh, came out okay, you know, they're getting some reasonable EQ, they're getting some fairly heavy heavy compression, but outside of that, they're not getting a whole lot. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then you mix it down, yeah. and uh, you mix it into a wave file, and then convert it to an MP3. Yeah, I do. Actually, I use... Uh, oh, they've changed the name of the program on me. Yeah, I, I do. Sorry, I, I went off mic. The, um, I, I mix it down to a wave and convert it to an MP3. I use Myriad on the, on, the, on the Mac to do all of my processing. 
which used to be called Sample Manager, I believe. Myriad. Yeah, it's by Audiophile Engineering. Okay. It's a wonderful uh, batch processor. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And then you just set it to, you know, MP3. Do you do a mono MP3 or stereo? Uh, well, that sorry, dumb question. Hold on. I, I got to ring the 1K tone. Yeah, dumb question. Sorry. You, you stereo, right? <laughs> I think you did. Kyle uh, just hang yeah. up on me. Oh no, I'm I'm there. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's move on. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I, 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 sometimes you know I'll do like a fixed bit rate one twenty eight twenty two dot oh one. Yeah. No. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, mono. I I just I don't think you're mi- <laughs> I don't think you're mixing it down to mono um, for an eight minute podcast, but about I audio mean, engineering. <laughs> it's it's not super stereo, but the bumper is. So yeah, we'll yeah yeah. Well, a lot of there's people in podcasting like Todd Cochran. He literally produces his show in mono, but he <laughs> but he puts it out in stereo just because <laughs> just because stereo is the the norm pretty much everywhere. So that, that seems a little counterintuitive, <laughs> but I'm not going to judge. I don't know. It, that, it says a lot about him. It 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 shows a lot of his personality. He's that kind of guy. He's like, I'm just going to do it this way. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, look to to each his or her own. I I've, I'm sure that I have a lot of bizarre production quirks that people would think are odd. So I mean. Whatever works for anyone is good enough for me. Right. So, All right. So let's yeah. go back to the creating audioscapes. Uh, sure. You talked a lot about how important that is and what a skill that is that someone can just yeah. literally take nothing and create a soundscape to evoke some emotion or space or movement and everything. So and a lot of people in podcasting do this and, and, and you know, Really, it's only for intros and outros. Usually, right? They're doing some sure. funny stuff, and um, I there's a I talked talk to Zach Hanny again. He was a he was a previous guest on the show, and he actually started working on a podcast. And it's all about like um, it's like about a game gaming like kind of like a Dungeons and Dragons type game. And he says in the intro they want to do certain voices and, you know, reverb and he's so so he actually gets to create a soundscape in the intro and uh, which of course he loves because he's an audio engineer. So um Sure. So so in podcasting it's definitely relevant although you're not going to use it every day and it's not going to be the bulk of your production, but but how do you uh, instruct your students to get started? I mean, do they where do they get the music or the voices or or what effects just Take us through it. Those are all really good questions. At least here, you know, we have uh, an institutional sound effects library that students use uh, just mm-hmm. because that that makes it easier for us. Honestly, I, I'm, I'm sort of forgetting uh, exactly where it's all come from. You know, I, it's going to be a lot of the same stuff that most people are going to license at this point, right? You know, it's going to be a lot of the sound effects, sound ideas, you know, all that stuff. And, you know, because we're an institution, it's just easy... And I can tell you, uh, some of the sound effects we have are old enough, you know, they came on CDs. Uh, you know, I stumbled into a room, you know, a while ago and, you know, th- we just had them stacked up and stacked up and stacked up. And that was pretty funny. Hey, by the way, but, d- uh, how many, yeah. how, what percentage of your students, and I'm I'm guessing more than 50%, have literally taken a, a microphone with a mic cable into a bathroom to record <laughs> to record a sound effect? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't I mean, every recording I, engineer do that at some point in their life? I would. I'm pretty sure I've forced them all to do that. I, I think we, you know, the bathroom. I, I think the that lesson. I just made, Yeah. I well, I, I think that it, so in, in my because I've got a class. I've I've got another class. It's it's our sound for film class. We call it sound for moving image. Um, I think mm. because we have a film school here, so we had to call it something else. But we, mm. um, you know, I th- I think actually the first week of the class, I hand them all zoom recorders and say go do this so oh, yeah cool. like yeah actually that's actually one of the first assignments that we so i mean you, you talk about creating soundscapes and we'll, so we'll come back to that but like one of the first assignments that i give them is it, this, this is getting a bit into sound art uh which actually i know is something that mary's sort of into oh cool but i call it a sound walk so i'll give them the assignment of like you know go out and you know, walk from here to your dorm or here to, you know, your your place of employment, you know, something like that. And then, like, write down literally everything that you hear, right? So, again, paint for me that that uh, that portrait, but, like, tell me about it. And then it's really interesting to hear, not to hear, I guess, but to see how students do that. Because, like, some of them will make me, like, 
like a bulleted list in Excel, right? But mm -hmm. then some people will be like just sort of long form narrative, like this is what happened. Like I, I came out onto Court Street, which is the name of the street. I came out onto Court Street and you know there were leaves blowing and you know I saw some of them skittering across the brick. You know I, I heard, you know the, I, I, I heard the vent fan uh, across the uh, across the quad and you know as you know the the turn signal for the car was going, I, I heard. A horn going, and I, I thought, well, should I should, should I go left or should I go right? And I'm sitting here thinking, all right, <laughs> that student, that student's got some potential right there. That that right there has the makings of some stuff, and that's that's really cool because like, and I don't know who I stole that from. I mean, I, I'm sure I stole it from someone who stole it from someone who stole it from someone over and mm -hmm. over iteratively, but like just as like a mental exercise. Like that's really cool to do, and like I've tried doing that just every once in a while, just to see, like, just to make sure that I can stay as sharp as I want my students to be, mm. because like, it's really easy to fall in that trap of you know being very programmatic. Like, yep, car horn, <laughs> you know, students being stupid, <laughs> mom yelling a kid, things skittering around the ground. But like, be like, trying to like be super into it, like super emotive, and like being like, yeah, this is what I hear, and man, like it is. It is. I am all for that stuff because um, that's what you have to be doing. And then, like one of the, like the next assignment. So I do that on day one. By the way, Barry just passed me a note said he he's done a sound walk, and um, I think his sound walk's different. And Barry, what did what did you hear on your sound walk? Monkeys, pumas, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I'm, I'm thinking his sound walk's different than mine, but no, like, it's like th this, like day three of the class, because like we'll come back and we'll talk about them and we'll I'll make them share and like stuff, right. and um, yeah, and stuff, right? But like, <laughs> yeah, day day three, because I do this like Tuesdays and Thursdays, we'll come in and I'm like, okay, so here's the deal, I want you to go out, and I want you to, I, I you, you guys go tell me a story. I don't give a crap what the story is. It can be, I'm serious. It can be completely contrived. It can be whatever it is. Tell me something about Athens, which is where I'm located in in Ohio. Tell me um, something that you like you've invented. Like, you know, go someplace on campus. I don't I don't care where it is. You've got an hour and a half. Record like five to ten like audio files. I know you've all got a smartphone. I don't even I don't care what the quality of the audio file is. Go and and tell me a story with sound. And I'll I'll send them like an upload link. Cuz like how easy how you know how hard is that, right? Like you've got your Android or your you know what or iPhone, like record some voice notes, right? Just some voice memos. Uh, and I'm like, look, if you need to text them to me, email them to me, I don't care. But you tell me a story. And I'm like it can be peaking it to, to holy heck. I don't care. Just right. we're going to come back and we're going to talk about it because this is about creativity. And I think that's that's really hard for a lot of students. And so we're in a college of communication. And so I come from a college of fine arts. And my first week with them or so in this class, I try to get these students to think like they're an artist, right? And which is sort of what we're, what we're talking about is how do you stop thinking like very much in the box common core standard like right. i got to do this cuz i'm supposed to and instead be like let me just go and create stuff right like that's really hard so, you right. know i'm trying to push them to be like let's just let's go make great art and that you know from there then like we 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 tend to be pretty much on even footing um, cause like the rest of the semester, I'm like, look, if you guys, if your audio peaks, I'm going to like throw things at you. Figuratively, <laughs> of course, figuratively. <laughs> that's all. Figuratively. -ish. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Ish. Oh God. Yeah. Ish. But no, like, cause I make a mix to broadcast standards, right? Because like I'm a human and I don't want my ears to bleed, but totally. like, like the first time I'm like, no, like this right now, this is about emotion. Like if it's peaking, it's fine. I'm going to throw a peak limiter on this. Like. Whenever we're playing it back, I don't care. Like, just let's talk about feelings and stuff, right? Which is weird to say, but like that's actually like that's important. Um, I I think there's a lot of times where that doesn't happen. So, do so. you tell uh, during that exercise? Do you tell them not to use, like, because do students ever just use their voice for every sound clip? Just them talking five different clips, or do you say, look, you can't use a human voice and only sound? 
Yeah, I, I, t- I tell them it has to be like a wild effect. Um, okay. And I, I don't even really go into it that much because we haven't discussed even what the definitions of the sounds are so much. Um, okay. You know, there are some students, whenever we get into like recording Foley, um, that a lot of them are like they want to make the sounds. And I'll, I'll let them do that for one if it seems quasi appropriate. But, you know, I, I do try to rein them in and be like, look, that's not what would really happen. So let's let's dig into the closet. Like, let's use our brains. Let's like let's really try like Foley's supposed to be hard. Like you're supposed to go in there and, you know, it's, this isn't super literal. Like, you know, the, the sound of a centipede might be like metal on the back of a belt or something. Like it it could be something super wild and super out there. And it might take you 30 minutes to figure out one sound. Like that's why it is like the most expensive thing to do in the world, you know, like, like get out there and like just think. So like one of their assignments uh, is also like just bring in things to use for Foley. And I'm like, look, if it's a piece of metal, the sound, like don't bring in a cookie sheet from home. Like <laughs> that's not that's not the thing. Like like go around, like like go to a thrift shop, like go to Goodwill. Like um like we've got like one of those uh, Habitat for Humanity reuse places here in town. I'm like, go there. Like it's just there's piles of stuff. Like you can play with it. They don't care. Mm. You know, like that's where I buy all of my glass for Foley because I'll, I'll get, you know, a big sheet for 50 cents. And then it's also helping Habitat for Humanity, which isn't exactly a bad thing. So I'm like, right. this is, you know, there, there's a win-win here. Plus then we get to break glass. All of these <laughs> things are great. <laughs> At the, that's cool. It's it's a, it's a win-win-win. This is, that never <laughs> happens. So. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I mean, it's it's a lot of fun. But I'm like, no, you got to, actually, they ha- they're in there. There's been a pink toilet for forever. And I so want to buy it and just demolish it. Oh, um, with a sledgehammer, right? Oh, gosh, yeah. That, to me, that would just be, ooh, man, like, super cathartic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you need video on that one. You need to film that. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I, I did. I, about a year ago, I bought myself one of those Joby Gorilla Pods for my iPhone. Just because a lot of what times whenever I'm in uh, one of the Joby Gorilla Pods, it's one of those, like, stands you can put your iPhone in that has sort of like the little balls as the stand so oh, like you can put it on a chair like yeah got it so like because I have an Apple watch and so like if I'm in the studio mixing or something like with a students or like if I'm giving a tour I can like trigger my phone to like take a couple photos of like the cool things that we're doing and I don't have to be like weird about like taking photos which of all things yeah. That, that's like totally yeah. not the reason to buy an Apple Watch, but it's <laughs> it's it's re- it's I have the world's most expensive camera remote. Uh, <laughs> I really do, but it's 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 been very nice just because like I can actually get action shots of like us working in the studio together that like we can throw on Instagram, which is like really kind of nice because whenever we're of all things. It's nice to be able to show prospective students and parents what it is that we do because to try to tell them about what Foley is, I can be like, hey, look, this is our post studio and these are the pits. And if you come back here another day, it'll look like absolute bedlam. But like right now it looks nice and safe because that's what it it should look like. But like on another day, there might be like a gutted turkey in here. We might just be beating the crap (laughs) out of it. Like, you know. You don't, you know, th- those bones breaking, that's what it's all about, man. Like, you, you don't know. You just don't know. And the way my the favorite... thud comes off of a turkey. <laughs> yeah. No, my, my favorite story is, like, our dean now, whenever he was uh, an interim dean, like, they had to, like, whenever we hire people, we have to treat them all fairly, which is very important. So they had to, like, give him a tour of the building, you know, just, like, because it all has to be the same. Right. So they were giving him a tour, and... They brought him into the Foley studio as we were like breaking glass, and so one of the students had had like wound up with like a big empty bottle of vodka that like we found in the in the uh, alley, and like it just it's it shattered as he walked into the room, and so he's just laughing. I'm like, well, thank heaven Scott knows what I'm doing and doesn't think I'm like abusing children. <laughs> Be like, lawsuits happening if it was the wrong person. <laughs> oh my god! On the upside. Looked super bad, you know, you know, yeah. <laughs> <sighs> All right, it's, so it's then, fun to then, do. Oh, man, you guys are having a fun time. I love it. And then, oh, so man, yeah, get... look, for, yeah, for the longest time, I tried to roll video, but sometimes it's just too hard. Oh, 
Yeah, and then editing takes a lot. Like like going through. Yeah, that's one of those things. It's like time. what's the what's the cost benefit of like taking the video versus the pain in my butt to like put it somewhere for it to die in value three minutes later. I'm like, uh. So, hey, what do you tell it, your students about capturing audio? Because one thing I, you know, I it, originally yeah. when I would go out in the field, I would just run my recorder for like four hours and be like, ooh, I'll go through it later and pick out the good parts. And then, of course, <laughs> you get home with four hours of audio and you're like, oh, my God, what have I done? And then you then you then I realize, OK, I'm just going to turn on the recorder for the three minutes that I need it in the field and then oh, come yeah. back and it's easy. You, right? I, I, I've fallen into, into that too and I mean I, I generally tell them you know I, I sort of wind up in a split personality with this one because in the studio my philosophy always is always roll tape because you just you never know mm. and I mean that that's a big thing right because like what if that one rehearsal that was just gold right right and that's why like I never let this I never allow talent to see my screen because like I'll make it so that I'm recording their rehearsal, and if that was the one good take we got, then that's awesome. And it's like that feels super dishonest. But like, what if that's the only way we got the good take? Like, I, you know, I've gotten a lot of great material that way, and so I don't feel bad. bad. That's that's me being a good producer. Sure. But you know, out in out in the field, like you should have a pretty good feeling for whether or not you, you should be rolling sound or not. You know. I would I'd generally, you know, only roll it when necessary because, yeah, you don't want to have to go, go through four and a half, five hours of junk. You know, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of telling students, you know, buy at least a Zoom and, you know, carry it around with you whenever you can. That having been said, the best microphone is the one that you've got on you at any time, right? So, right. you know, I'm I'm a pretty pretty big proponent of even like the little attachable mics for the iPhones. Right. Um, those are pretty rad. I've I've had some source stuff from those that's really very acceptable uh, and works really very nicely because, I mean, it's the same thing with, with cameras, right? They say the best camera is the one that's on you. And so I have a DSLR. It literally never gets touched. And <laughs> I feel super crappy about that. Like, it's a lovely D90. Like, body's pretty aging. It's got a burnt pixel. It's got great glass. I know that I could swap it out for a new body and, like, it'd be great. I could do, you know, video and stuff. But, like, I, I bought my 7 Plus because... I t it takes amazing pictures, and I can't pit, fit a D90 in my pocket. <laughs> right. Like, even Barry's not going to find that acceptable. So, like, I, I really don't know w what to do with that. Like, it's that whole sort of consumerization of, of stuff, right? Like, at what point is it acceptable, right? Like, I don't like that there's GarageBand on the phone, but then, like, if people want to create that way and they can send it off to a mix engineer and we can get something acceptable... Is that good enough? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I've heard some albums that have been done fully on those things, and they're they're good enough, and they seem to do well. So, like it, yeah. like I like I mean, as a super technical engineer, like it, it's a hard mental headspace for me to exist in because I don't want to work that way. But like, if it's good enough for those people, like then okay, that's fine, you know. Totally, I'm, I'm told that it's a sign of I, I'm told that it's a sign of maturity that I can hold. Uh, multiple conflicting opinions at once. So. <laughs> yeah, um, well, that's it's true. All the, the although technology... I, I become melancholic once I hit that, but like it, yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, all the you're right. All the new technology makes it so easy and portable, and and like yes, of course, it's not as good as being in a studio, but um, you know, depending on the background noise and the recording level, and I mean, if if certain yeah. things just sort of line up well. You know, hey, like there's not much background noise, and it's recorded at yeah. a nice, healthy level, and it's 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 directly in between the two people who are talking, so the balance is good. Like, you yeah, know, at times, yeah, it just comes out great. Well, even like, first of all, I'm pretty sure if you go back to that clip of me, I'm sure you, pretty sure you can hear me getting sad as I talk myself into that thing being okay. <laughs> Second of all, or at least melancholic. Um, like the the new cool thing, I'm gonna mess up the full name of it, but DPA has that new really cool hockey puck where you can go right into your iPhone with like two of their little um, lavaliers, right? Like, have you seen that? No. Gosh, I'm gonna mess up the. I almost want to grab my computer and look it up now. Yeah, it's or really. If yeah. you want, I can look it up. Yeah, if you want to, it's um because my computer's like more than a, a foot away from me. Yeah, it's 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 really super cool, and I'm like. So I, I'm trying to figure out who that will benefit, but clearly, like, 
reporters in the field, like doing stuff like that, or like even if we were together recording this podcast, like that would that would be super useful. I'm like, I, I can totally see the use in that. And like DPA obviously knows what they're doing. Like of all things, like I I <laughs> as a classical engineer, like DPA, Sheps, Coles, you know, those are my go to mics. Like I trust that if DPA is going to come out with a device like that, they're going to build a, a preamp that works well enough that it, it's it's going to be suitable for the mobile environment. So I'm like, wow, guys, that's that's pretty rad. I, I, I sort of wonder how they pulled it off, but that's that's really sort of amazing to me. Right. It is pretty amazing. I looked it up. I couldn't find much. But anyway, I'll look it up later and put it in the show notes for sure. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Or if it turns out I was full of BS, just cut it. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right. So when when you get your students into, okay, th- now they're opening a DAW. Now they're putting sound clips into a DAW and sort of mixing little segments of soundscapes. Um, sure. Just take us through that real quick. Sure. Yeah. Gosh, I'm not quite sure how to take you through that. Um, so that's, let's start. Okay, let's yeah, start yeah, of with, course. Um, let's start with... Um, well, the sound clips, you said they have sound libraries. They can get it from there. And then effects and stuff. What kind of uh, plugins and effects do you ha- teach them how to use to get the the, the ambiance? <laughs> That's that, that, very nice. That's nice. Um, have you, has anyone ever said you've got a face for a radio? But still. Um, anyways. Oh, jeez. Um, so I mean, for if if we want to head in that direction, um, I mean, my, my my general pitch to students is you know lay things out in a linear fashion that makes sense for, makes sense to you, and then sort of start processing things. But I've never known a student to listen to me, and that's okay. Uh, <laughs> most that's fine. Um, I, I'm not that. I'm, no, it's fine. I, I, I'm thinking about all the things that they've done wrong, and you know that I'm getting sad again, which is fine. I've, uh, you, it looks like there's a Nalgene bottle of water down here, but I'm sure it's just gin that I'm just chugging compulsively. But so you know, Barry the, said um, he was he was eavesdropping on one of your classes one time, and you were talking to a student. And uh, Barry, what did you hear? And they were cussing up a storm. Profanity that does sound like, yeah. Profanity is right. <laughs> Seems about right, but no. So. Basically, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of, like I said, like lay it out in a linear fashion, do what you want. Pretty much every student, as soon as they get into, I, we start them out in Pro Tools here, despite my strenuous objections. Um, once they get it laid out in Pro Tools, you know, th- they immediately want to jump in and like, let's start being creative. And I'm like, okay, like you do what you want to do. That's fine. Um, and so a lot of them are going to want to start doing things like, okay, well, let's let's start make, start creating space. And a lot of students immediately want to do things like, okay, let's throw a reverb on it. And so that creates some problems, right? Because immediately whenever you first learn about reverb, you're like, whoa, let's completely wash it out. That'll be great. <laughs> yeah. um, a canyon. <laughs> but, right. Like it's it's from zero to everything. All at once. Um, totally. And that's when we have to have, right. So that when we have to have the discussion of like, okay, there's lots of ways to create space kids. So first of all, there's things like left and right. And that's a pretty big deal too. Uh, <laughs> There's this thing called stereo, and I hear it's going to be big unless you produce in mono, but still stereo. Stereo is going to be a big thing. Uh, so I'm told, but also like just a little bit of a little bit of space, right? Like just adding a little bit of light delay. So like you take it from feeling like it's being pressed like a fork into your skull to being like a foot away. Delay is your friend, my friend. Uh, yeah. So that's honestly where I try to start them out. Um, with uh, sort of their their general effects and, you know, things like EQ and like sort of like the distressor type effects, right? Sort of giving them grunge and things like that. But there's actually some really cool, um, for the AES members out there, since I should do the three second pitch, uh, <laughs> if, you are a, if you are a member, uh, there's some really cool like tutorials about like compression and EQ and delay and reverb that are behind the paywall uh, that like if you want to know about that sort of technical stuff. It's what we call in the AES Live uh, library, mm-hmm. uh, and you can learn all about that sort of stuff. Um, so just just know that. And honestly, that's one of the re- ways that I show uh, my students how to do that is um, I like to think that I'm a pretty good educator, but one of the ways that I get them to not curse at me, uh, which, you, Barry, you're correct, mm-hmm. um, is that I try to bring in other educators to help break up the tedium, not you know bringing them in you know, via uh, 
carriage and buggy, but just, you know, th- playing them these really cool videos. It's like your own sort of private lynda.com mm. um, and just sort of showing them other techniques because I, I think the universal truth in the world is that um, people are always going to take advice from people other than you. Mm. Um, and, you know, just sort of showing them, hey, this is what this other person does. And then they're like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. And that, that honestly seems to work pretty well. Uh, one of the other cool things, um, you were talking about creating soundscapes. And there's actually a cool podcast uh, of all things that I'm producing here on campus. And it's um, it's being run through our Media and Medicine project. And it's called Rotations. And so Media and Medicine uh, produced a really cool film. It's uh, called The Veterans Project. And it's all about you know veterans as they come back from... Um, from uh, as they came back from uh, several conflicts overseas, you know, uh, a lot of them were flight medics and dealing with the different uh, VA processes and uh, the, the different types of trauma that uh, that are involved with that. But one of the offshoots from that is called uh, Rotations, and it's uh, a series of podcasts from um, two medical students as they go from the first year to their second year of medical school, and it's really kind of cool. And they're going through, and they're actually. Uh, essentially dealing with all the questions that they have as students that are transitioning from year one to year two. And so they're Skyping in all these experts and they're actually, uh, it's, it's a video uh, podcast. So they're doing a, like a multi-camera shoot with a sort of a four banger microphone set up and one person calling in. And in producing it, I helped them set up all of the backline with that, uh, which was pretty cool. And I'm helping them post-produce all of the audio. And one of the cool things is... Uh, I've, I've been helping them sort of come up with their uh, intro audio logo. So with rotations, they wanted sort of like a gear cog thing. So like they've got some bike wheels and things like that. Mm. Uh, so I got to do like a lot of really cool sound design where we, you know, did a lot of, you know, bike wheel turning and, you know, cogs and things like that. So that was, that was a, a really awesome opportunity to, like you were saying, sort of create a little landscape um, and like pull things from libraries and say, oh, okay, well, let's sort of match this, you know, turning ratio to that, uh, and you know, do some effects processing, and you know, speed some things up, and you know, and twist some things around, um, and so you know, get it to where they were pretty happy, which was a lot of fun. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, I'm gonna find that rotations. Cool. I'm gonna put that in the yeah. show notes. I think. Yeah, I think they actually have the first couple things up. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I, at least they should. So yeah, um, and that, that that was pretty awesome. And so that that one technically is it's not anything super extravagant. So they, we 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 sort of have been shooting it a little bit like a, um, I mean it's 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 like a true double system uh, audio setup. So there's uh, four microphones on four stands, you know, running into actually like a Zoom style recorder, and then you know there's audio from that. Uh, actually, the audio is running into a uh, into like a little Mackie mixer. And then the Mackie's uh, powering, you know, uh, a four banger head headphone preamp. And then there's audio from Skype, you know, coming out of a coming out of a Mac, and, you know, that's running into the Mackie. So you know, we've got you know one feed going to the going to Skype, another feed coming uh, into the headphones. And then you know, there's three different cameras around the uh, around the room. And so you know, everything gets slated at the beginning, and then whenever it gets posted. You know, all the audio and video gets dumped into Final Cut, and then we use Pluralize, and then everything gets sunk up, which is pretty cool. Oh, Pluralize, it syncs the video with the audio? Yeah. So, you know, at the beginning, we slate it, Got and it. then, yep. And then what do you suggest they do? with the, They have four mics in one room, right? Yeah. Okay, and then how do you so, do a post-production on that to clean it all up and make it nicey nice? So, so what we're actually doing, uh, this has been... Slightly less than ideal, but it's actually worked out okay. I, I was a little bit worried about it, but we're actually mixing it down to stereo in real time, and that has not worked out bad. Just in in general, like the the mix turns out pretty okay um, because it's in it's not in a a, a a super dead room. It's in a fairly live office. Uh, but, you know, we pulled some curtains. You know, we put up another curtain. You know, made it as dead as we could. Uh, and honestly, I'm I'm running RX on it. As sort of a final pass, which you know I don't like doing that as a as a quote unquote mix process, mm-hmm. um, but that removes you know some of the room noise, and you know then I'll add a little bit of reverb in there to sort of clean it up a little bit. But for I don't want to say an amateur podcast, but for a podcast that 
you know, it's it's not one for a major client. You know, it was a couple people, you know, trying to forge their way and see what worked out well. It's worked out surprisingly well. You know, I I think for people who are just sort of getting into it, um, that's not a bad way to start uh, because, you know, they didn't pour in thousands of dollars into their equipment. Right. You know, it, it turned out um, surprisingly well. You know, I <clears throat> if it were me, I would have, you know, multi-tracked the audio and, you know, dumped it into a computer. But if you don't have that or if, if you don't have that technical knowledge, um, you know, starting out simple where, you know, they do have an analog board. And so one of the more interesting things that I got to do over the summer actually was, you know, I went down to the our, uh, the, the building where uh, this is at. It's the Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine's uh, building. And, you know, I helped them set up their stuff. And then I got to teach these two medical students, you know, how do you use an analog mixing console? You know, and it's, it's just a little Mackie, but, you know, if they've never done that, you know, what, what's that like? And right. so I'm like, okay, so when you hear it get crunchy, that's bad. And they're like, okay, so how do we not do that? I'm like, okay, so this is going to be fun. And so I got to walk them through like the first three weeks of an intro audio course in about 15 minutes. I'm like, so you see these red lights? <laughs> yeah. So you know what like a glucose wave or like a, a sine wave looks like, right? They're like, yeah. I'm like, okay. So imagine this, and I'm, I'm drawing some sinusoidal waveforms. I'm like, imagine what happens if we cut these things off on the top. <laughs> That's what happens when you hit that. We don't want that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, technically I could fix that, but we really can't fix that. So let's not do that. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, red, bad, red, bad. <laughs> right. Wow. So like, it was, it was really cool. I'm like, let's, let's try to teach them as much as we can in literally like 15 minutes. And it's turned out pretty well it sort of goes to show that like really anyone can learn anything as long as they really want to um, all right i love that as so, i sit here looking on indeed for my next career now <laughs> <laughs> so we're getting uh, close to the end well wait before we move on you sure the four people on the four mics they must be uh having pretty good microphone technique i'm sure you told them all the get right on the mic and all that and that's why yeah, i mean and so that down <laughs> the stereo so of all things and god help me i'm sure it's out there i don't even know if it's if it's out there but so i was a guest on the first show uh literally so i could demonstrate proper mic technique <laughs> oh that is cool yeah so like i'm i'm there in video i didn't even realize we were going to shoot the first show that day um and that's hilarious but so like i ap- actually knew they were talking about like general research methods and so one of the things that I do know about is just like general research from a university standpoint, like institutional methods and things like that. So I actually was able to partake in the conversation, thank heavens. <laughs> but it was very weird. I'm like, and I'm on a medical podcast now. That's a new milestone for me. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty cool, though. I like that. that you could actually yeah. demonstrate it. Because that's a big part of it. If people can see someone, how they work oh, yeah. the mic, how you, when you're talking, you're right on the mic. And when you're not talking, you might lean back a little and... And not breathe oh, yeah. right into the mic like a horse. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, honestly, a lot of it is, yeah, being comfortable enough so that, like, you can learn how to, like, m- sort of self-mix yourself, right? Like, but thankfully, I think enough people at this point have seen enough of, like, the the video shows of, like, the professional podcast or, or radio shows that they understand what should mic technique look like, even if they don't know it enough. Right. Like, it's it's becoming ingrained in our society which is a whole other interesting cultural f- phenom. So. Yeah. But hey, the people coming in on Skype though wearing their earbuds, they I don't they don't always <laughs> know that. <laughs> oh. No, it's true. Sometimes it's brutal. I have a whole literally a whole class in the podcast engineering school is about connecting people through the internet, how to sound check them, how to make sure you're recording it properly and how to make them so that they're not flapping around their earbuds, you know, and just wreaking havoc and sometimes it's difficult oh, i can believe that yeah yeah so ohio university in athens ohio you're a lecturer uh in the school of media arts and studies i'm gonna have some of your links in the show notes and i have one more question so don't go away Hit yet me. i have one more question um you're a freelance engineer and consultant for white coat audio you're the chair of education for aes you were telling me about aes the audio engineering society has a nice group here in colorado so i'm gonna look into that uh, I've never been a member of AES. Oh, that might not be true. I might have joined way back when, <laughs> but 
I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to look into that. It's okay. We're, we're, we're a nice, friendly group of people. We're not like student loan people. We're not going to come hunt you down. Just join. <laughs> you'll, you'll enjoy it. <laughs> right. And you said that the AES convention in New York in the fall is combining with NAB. So that's pretty cool. I will. Yeah. My, th- that's the one thing I will plug is, um, especially if you're on the East Coast and you can get there easy, uh, it's um, it's co-located with NAB this fall. So that Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, it's going to be super tight. Um, it's like it's it's amazing. So uh, AES is always a phenomenal time. It's uh, for for some people, it's a religious experience. I've not missed an AES convention since the first time that I went. Uh-huh. Um, it, it is honestly very life altering for a lot of people. But uh, if you can make it to the one where we're with NAB, um, that is going to be really awesome. Because I mean, big show floor, and who doesn't like looking at gear? You don't have to buy it; just go touch it. Right? It's going to be fun. What are the dates yeah. on that? Oh, it's going to be. Hold on. Hold the phone. Hey, Barry, are you going to be at uh, AES uh, this fall? We're not letting yeah. him in. We oh, already yeah. decided that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be uh, October 18th to the 20th is going to be the exhibits, and that's when we're there with NAB. All right. That's awesome. So I wanted to ask you about, we, we, we kind of touched on RX, uh, that you use oh, RX yeah. to fix audio and that kind of thing. What advice do you have for podcasters about recording and and just a few generalities would be good but what are what's some advice for podcasters about recording it properly in the first place so that later on you <laughs> don't have to jump through nine hoops and kill yourself yeah i was going to say I, I thought you were going to ask about rx and i was going to say well first of all just get good audio so you don't have to use it, <laughs> it yeah you might not know this but you could spend a little bit of money well here yeah i guess that's one so <laughs> Boy, I was gonna I was gonna be snarky, but I guess it turns into an actual comment. Gosh, that sucks when that happened. Teachable moment. Um, so, like, I'm in a very uh, very sealed room right now, but there are a lot of things that you might do f- very inexpensively to your room to improve it. Like right now, I'm using the very inexpensive RLX reflection filter. Um, there are a lot of things that you could, that you could do like that. Uh, uh, I don't know all of them. I know what SE has one of them. Uh, Orlex has a better version of this one because this is a, the the cheap one of them. Um, you you know you can build a sort of a small enclosure for yourself. Um, first of all, well I guess second of all, I'm using um, a, a fantastic condenser microphone, right? So it's a Neumann TLM 103. Right. Um, but you know whenever I used to do podcast things from my house, uh, very close to a furnace. You know, I didn't use a condenser microphone. I used a dynamic microphone, right? Mm. Because that has a, that has a slower response. It has far greater off-axis um, rejection. Uh, rejection. Yeah. Um, so you know, use the technology to your advantage, right? So if you can spend a little bit of money improving your situation, you won't, you won't have to spend a thousand dollars on RX, and then you know. Imagine how smart you'll feel compared to your friends who were stupid and bought a blue spark and ran it through a <laughs> crappy audio interface made by Avid, and then they have to spend $1,500 on RX. See what a bad thing I did there? Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Then then rack your brain about it and then listen back. Oh, it's, it's the, the time and you're consumption like, is the worst. I don't know. I, I used the focus button. I thought that was going to fix it. Well, the mic was bad to begin with. <laughs> Oh my Anyways, God. um well this so I'm sorry I went a bad place but no seriously <laughs> um if no. you like th- that that's what I would do like I like like an RE t- RE320 or something like that like not a cheap mic but like it's got like phenomenal off axis rejection like anything like that like get yourself something that like sort of cloisters you from the the world around you um like not a monastery but like get yourself some decent foam um, like I know that there's some like little booths that you can set up that do this pretty well. Um, like you can spend not a lot of money and get some pretty great results. So yeah. there you go. Be a little, and also uh, lots of blue, lots of blue microphones and Avid interfaces are good. Just not those two. <laughs> um. Well, that's it, man. This has been awesome. Kyle P. Snyder. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Thank you, man. Great having you. Yes, I'm so happy you could come here. Thanks for sharing so much. This was like, you know, head blown off type of session. So I know everybody listening enjoyed it. So until next time, you can go listen to our previous sessions. And Kyle, you just have to yell out, sound great when I tell you to, okay? 
I can do that. All right, so here we go. Until next time, Kyle, go! Sound great! Sound great. You walk away from me where And you can't say that I'm so real But you're playing out on me now, now You like to lose control where Your fear is now